Hyatt is a term that uh, first was initiated in the early 1990s. It was based on a lot of work initially from Barbara Drinkwater's group. And there was this correlation that people noted between relative energy deficiency or not enough calories for how much the people were um, expending in sport, and then menstrual dysfunction, and then poor bone health. Initially, it was the, at the far end of the spectrum where people really had eating disorders and they had osteoporosis and they had full-on amenorrhea. But now we realize over time that it can really be a continuum. And so it's important that we screen our female athletes, asking them about menstrual cycle, working on their um, nutritional knowledge and making sure that even though they might present at some place in the middle of this, this diagram, that they can, knowing that they can easily fall to the left-hand corner. So the last position statement about the female athlete triad came out in 2014, and there was also one uh, a few months later by the International Olympic Committee. And the IOC said, you know, the female athlete triad is very important, but there are other things that can happen. There are other health and performance consequences, and this isn't just an issue for females, but relative energy deficiency can also affect men. So they have these two diagrams. The diagrams actually originated with Nama Constantini from Israel, who's part of this IOC group. And basically, it keeps the triad there because the triad has so much data, so much research behind it, but also emphasizes that there could be endocrine effects, metabolic effects, hematologic effects, and so on. So 10 different health consequences, and then also 10 different uh, potential performance consequences. So increased injury risk, decreased training response, their judgment, all sorts of different things. So with the Female Athlete Triad Coalition, they came up with this return to play approach about the triad. Um, in 2014, they published this return to play algorithm where basically people get points for how they land in terms of their eating, their BMI, their menarche, um, how regular their periods are, low bone mineral density on a DEXA, and then if they've had stress reaction or stress fracture and they're given a point system. The IOC the next year came up with another type of system, but instead of giving points, it was more of a red light, yellow light, green light to say if it's a high risk person who has anorexia nervosa, no start. We need to evaluate them. We need to get them good medical care. We need to stop them from just doing their normal training and really make sure that they're closely monitored. So it's beyond the scope of this talk, but um, this, this week we published a paper comparing these two, looking at a thousand athletes and comparing how they stack up against one another. And I would say take home point is we probably need to come up with some sort of combination, to make it easier for clinicians. So that paper is an IJSNEM month. So I want to go through the different aspects of of REDS to tell you about some of the performance and health consequences. We'll start with the triad. And basically, the initial idea was that negative energy balance leads to disruption of the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. And that would then cause a decrease in estrogen, which would cause a decrease in bone mineral density. However, it's not that simple. And so Ann Laux did some studies where she looked at recreational female adult women and had them in a very controlled environment and then affected what their energy availability was. And what she found was that as people's energy availability dropped below 30 kilocals per kg of fat-free mass per day, there was a big change in their LH pulsatility and LH amplitude. And you can see that there's this asymptotic, asymptotic relationship that happened, and so these things um, changed dramatically as the number went down from 30. But what's interesting is that as energy availability dropped below 30, bone protein synthesis and mineralization dropped, Insulin, which enhances amino acid uptake, dropped. IGF-1 dropped. T3 dropped. And these effects occurred within five days of the onset of energy deficiency and before there was even a reduction in estrogen. So there are a lot of other things at play besides estrogen. In fact, everything on this slide is affected by low energy availability. So the things in green are particularly positive predictors of bone mass, and the things in red are negative predictors of bone mass. And so you can see all of these things are changed in sort of the wrong direction with low energy availability. By the way, I'm happy to share my slides. There's a lot of information here, and I know I, I talk fast. So we did a study looking at amenorrheic athletes, amenorrheic athletes and healthy controls, and we did something called high-resolution peripheral quantitative CT, and those are the images that you get from HRP CT. And we found that athletic activity in general causes an increase in cross-sectional bone area. So we were using weight-bearing athletes. These are predominantly runners and their tibias had a greater cross-sectional bone area compared to the non-athlete. But in the amenorrheic athletes, they actually had a decrease in trabecular number, a decrease in cortical thickness, and that decrease in trabecular and total bone mineral density that they had actually left to decrease stiffness and failure load. So they had weaker bones. So we were able to apply this nice 
um, engineering program called finite elemental analysis to really determine the strength of the bones and the amenorrheic athletes had weaker bones. So moving on to other aspects of the endocrine system, another paper that's a bit dense but really explains what we know to this point about the endocrine changes in REDS uh, was published in IJSNEM last year. And just to go through a few of the different hormones that fluctuate during red, um, testosterone, so there are papers that have looked at testosterone levels in, in females and males. Some of the ones in the female athletes actually were a little murky because they had some people with some hyperandrogenism in those studies, but in general, typically the testosterone level is either normal or decreased. In men with reds, they have either normal or decreased testosterone. In both men and women, the resting metabolic rate and leptin are down, oxytocin and insulin are down, and free T3 is down. So these are other markers that sometimes can be used to prove the red uh, syndrome. So just to talk about the thyroid, giving a, a few studies to prove this point, there, were, there was a study with 32 subjects in a cross-sectional study, and there was lower T4 and T3 in the amenorrheic athletes versus amenorrheic athletes in the healthy controls. In another study with 27 subjects, again, amenorrheic, amenorrheic, and healthy controls, the TSH response to t thyroid um, releasing hormone stimulation was blunted in the amenorrheic athletes, so the thyroid didn't respond as well. And then in another study with 27 eumenorrheic non-athletes, they were trying to determine what was the cutoff for the energy availability that would find this difference. So there were four days of exercise, but these athletes had different energy availability. And there was a decrease in T3 and free T3 between an energy availability of 19 and 25, and then an increase in T4 and reverse T3 when it was even lower. So looking more like a sick thyroid syndrome like you might see in somebody um, who's been hospitalized for a while. In general, the marker that can be used and is most consistently off in all of these thyroid studies is T3. So what about metabolic rate? Well, basically there was a small study of normal weight women. They had different exercise and caloric intake alterations for three months. They were either severely energy deficient, so about down about 1,000 calories from what they should have, moderately deficient, down about 600 calories, and then they had a balanced diet. Weight loss occurred in those severely energy deficient and the moderately deficient, but significantly less than predicted. But the resting metabolic rate went down by about 6% in the moderately restricted. In the severely energy deficient, the resting metabolic rate did not change as much for the entire group, but those whose resting metabolic rate did go down lost more weight and had a higher baseline resting metabolic rate to begin with. So if they were already in a little bit of a suppressed um, metabolic state to begin with, there wasn't as much of a change, but if they were in a more normal metabolic state to begin with, they had a severe reduction. And then there were expected changes in leptin T3 and IGF-1 and ghrelin like we would see in those other pictures I showed you earlier, so that was consistent with the model. The energy deficit and adaptive changes in the resting metabolic rate explained 54% of their weight loss. And this is where people run into trouble, just the general population, when they're trying to gain weight, uh, their metabolic rate often speeds up. When they're trying to lose weight and they're really restricting their calories, their resting metabolic rate can slow down. So what about the hematologic system? So many athletes with reduced energy availability have iron deficiency. Iron deficiency can worsen the hypometabolic state associated with decreased energy availability. And it's important for T4 synthesis. It's important for T4 synthesis and for T4 to T3 conversion. Iron deficiency can actually promote energy deficiency because it shifts ATP production from oxidative phosphorylation to anaerobic pathways. And iron is also needed for reproductive function, so follicular development and corpus luteum function. So it's very tied into this red model. Additionally, there's some studies that demonstrate that bone health may also be further impaired by iron deficiency. So there could even be yet another triad here. Uh, one of the authors of the triad um, paper actually came up with this triad with an iron deficiency in the middle of it. Then we get to growth and development. I think we've all probably taken care of some athletes who were quite young, who did a lot of training early on and were not eating enough, and they may have a little delay in their growth curve. So this is the growth curve of a ballet dancer I was taking care of, and you can see how her height plateaus as her weight sinks. Um, so certainly we can see this, this abrupt change in growth and development that can improve when these people are fueling better. Um, this can also be an issue in places that don't have a lot of um, food availability as well. Psychologically, so the arrow on the triad diagram here goes in both directions. So certainly psychological impairments can affect energy intake and vice versa. So there's a drive for thinness that was assessed in exercising in sedentary women using the eating disorder inventory, the EI. 
athletes with a high drive for thinness versus athletes and non-athletes with a normal drive for thinness scored higher on questions regarding bulimia, ineffectiveness, and cognitive restraint. They experienced more oligoamenorrhea versus the other two groups. And they had lower resting energy expenditure and actual resting energy expenditure over predictive resting energy expenditure. More of these athletes were classified as energy deficient. They had a lower T3 and a higher ghrelin, consistent with those other models. And there was a significant negative correlation between drive for thinness and T3, adjusted resting energy expenditure, and a positive correlation between drive for thinness and ghrelin. Another study looking at adult lightweight male rowers, and I should make the point that really, um, you know, this REDS model, there, there's a lot more studies looking at women in REDS, but there are get, there are becoming more and more studies with men in REDS. So in adult lightweight male rowers, the high levels of cognitive control of eating were accompanied with body dissatisfaction under hunger, but not, not satiety. So we are now studying more lightweight men, more um, track and field athletes as well. So what about the cardiovascular system? So in postmenopausal women, there are decreased levels of endogenous estrogen that unfavorably modify the lipid levels in vascular function. Premenopausal women with anorexia nervosa and athletes with amenorrhea, we see poor lipid levels. Um, theories include interactions of estrogen deficiency, liver dysfunction, dehydration, reduced cholesterol turnover, decreased T3 again, and delayed cholesterol metabolism. Retrospective data suggests development of early coronary artery disease in some older premenopausal women who had a history of functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. So how does this work? Basically, estrogen stimulates vascular endothelium, and this leads to increased endothelial drive nitric oxide, and that leads to vasodilation, and we need vasodilation for muscle proper function. Nitric oxide also has anti-atherosclerotic properties, so it inhibits platelet aggregation, smooth muscle proliferation, and an LDL oxidation. And estrogen and regular aerobic physical activity are independently associated with enhanced synthesis and or bioavailability of endothelial nitric oxide. So there's a way to test dilation, it's called flow-mediated dilation of the vessels, and it can assess endothelial function in the brachial artery. So it is a 95% positive predictive value of abnormal brachial dilation. Um, there's a 95% positive prediction of what is actually happening in the coronary endothelial um, function. So by testing this um, peripheral vessel, we can also kind of interpret what's happening on at the heart. So with flow-mediated dilation, looking at amenorrheic athletes versus um, oligomenorrheic athletes and eumenorrheic athletes, it was lower, and serum, serum estrogen levels positively correlated with vascular function. When people had restored vascular function, it was associated with an increase in estrogen levels in those amenorrheic athletes who became eumenorrheic. So when they were tested in an amenorrheic state, they had this decreased flow-mediated dilation, and then when they became eumenorrheic, that flow-mediated dilation improved. So moving on to the GI system, uh, there's a systematic review of 123 articles of patients with anorexia nervosa. They had delayed gastric emptying, increased intestinal transit time, and constipation. They also had elevated liver enzyme. Um, it was harder to find studies truly looking at just athletes, so we actually did a survey looking at different REDS aspects of a thousand female school medicine clinic, um, thousand female school medicine Boston Children's Hospital clinic. So these were people 15 to 30 years of age. They did equal to or greater than four hours a week of exercise. We asked them a series of questions about those different aspects of REDS, um, different health consequences different histories of injury and illness, and we also gave them three different eating disorder questionnaires. So we used that as a surrogate marker for low energy availability, so it was either self-reported disordered eating and eating disorder, uh, the beta Q, which is the brief eating disorder uh, questionnaire for, for sports medicine, and then the ESP, which is a primary care sports, um, sorry, primary care eating disorder screening tool. So we had about an 85% response rate. Um, I blame that on having really good research coordinators who are persistent in the waiting room and also for really inefficient physicians who keep the patients waiting. So we did pretty well by having our patients sitting around waiting for the physician. What was really disturbing is that we had almost an, a 50% rate of low energy availability using those surrogates. So we're asking young women just simple questions about their eating and about 50% of them said that they either had an eating disorder, disordered eating, or, or screened positively on those eating disorder questionnaires which just brings home the point that we really need to be aware of the issue and we need to be talking about a lot. 
So the people who had low EA, basically 1.5 times greater odds of GI complaints than those who did not have low EA. Um, we also looked at immunologic function uh, in, in looking at studies that are about this. So athletes with high training loads often experience impaired immune function, frequent upper respiratory infections. We know this. Um, interestingly, a decrease in salivary IgA correlates with an increase in upper respiratory infection. So salivary IgA also correlates with salivary estradiol. So in a study that came out of Japan, they looked at 21 elite collegiate runners. They were either amenorrheic or they were eumenorrheic. And they looked at salivary IgA levels, the serum 17 beta estradiol and progesterone, and the number of upper res respiratory infections that they'd had in the last month. The amenorrheic athletes had lower levels of serum estradiol as expected, and they had lower levels of IgA secretion, and they had more upper respiratory infection. Another, store, another study out of Australia looked at elite Australian athletes prepping for Rio for the 2016 game. And they had low EA measured by the LEAF Q, which is a low energy availability questionnaire for female athletes. And the increased odds of illness, so upper respiratory and GI tract infection, body aches, head related symptoms in the prior month uh, occurred in those who had low energy availability. So, when we talk about different potential performance effects, I'll just go through a couple here. Uh, there was a study of 10 junior elite female swimmers. So these are 15 to 17 year old female athletes. They were either cyclic, meaning they got their menstrual cycle, or they were ovarian suppressed, meaning they didn't, and they had low estradiol and low progesterone based on levels that were monitored in their urine. So they were monitored every two weeks, over 12 weeks. The ovarian suppressed obviously had decreased estrogen and progesterone throughout the season. They also had a decreased T3, again, a really good marker. And they had decreased IGF-1 at the 12 weeks uh, versus those who were cyclic and getting their period every month. Energy intake and energy availability was lower in the ovarian suppressed athletes. And this is the interesting part, and I love sharing this study, um, kind of explaining it to my athletes. So the ovarian suppressed athletes had a 9.8% increase time in their 400 meter swim time, while the cyclic athletes, the eumenorrheic athletes, had an 8.2% decrease in time. So you're taking an athlete who's training for three months and doing the exact same training as her colleague, and if she's not getting her period and she's energy deficient, she's actually getting slower while her colleague is getting faster. In our survey, we found about a 1.5 times greater odds of decreased endurance performance with low energy availability versus those adequate energy availability. Um, in another study we did, we looked at the proportion of amenorrheic athletes, eumenorrheic athletes, and non-athletes who had had stress fracture um, every year of their life. So we basically did a survey with them, followed them, got MRI records, um, got medical records, and talked about when they had had, had these stress injuries. So, the non-athletes are gray, and you might notice they're not on this picture, and that's because the non-athletes weren't doing anything repetitive to give themselves a bone stress injury. But the amenorrheic athletes are in black, and you can see as they get older and they remain amenorrheic, their bone dense or their um, stress fracture incidence goes up and up and up. Around 13, 14, 15, eumenorrheic athletes who are in the white bars had a few stress injuries, but that coincides with when they're going through their growth spurt, when the bones are elongating but they're not filling in as quickly. Sometimes we call that transient osteopenia, so that, that's why we see a lot more fractures during that growth. But then they stop fracturing. We then looked at their bone microarchitecture and their bone density, and we found that those who had two or more bone stress injuries or, or stress fractures had worse bone density than those who had fewer than two. So this got to be a little bit of a clinical pearl for us. So now when I see an athlete in clinic and they've had two or more stress injuries and they have menstrual irregularity, I get a bone density on them. In terms of their HRPQCT data, it was also worse. And in terms of their strength, when we applied that finite elemental analysis program, their bone quality and strength was worse as well. When we look at the, the um, circle about decreased muscle strength, so neuromuscular performance has been assessed in elite amenorrheic athletes and eumenorrheic athletes. They looked at knee muscular strength and knee muscular endurance, and it was worse in the amenorrheic athletes. And the reaction time was 7% longer for eumenorrheic athletes. Um, they had decreased leg fat-free mass, glucose, estrogen free, and increased cortisol levels that correlated with these findings. So I know that was a whirlwind, but I'd say the future directions here are that we need studies exploring other health and performance effects of low energy availability in female and male able-bodied and disabled athletes 
So now we need to be applying a lot of these things and these theories also to our para-athletes. We need more uh, studies determining eff efficacy of the return to play protocols. And again, I referred you to that paper where the triad group is actually saying we need a point system and the reds group is saying, well, we need to flag if any of these things are positive and maybe we need to mesh those two. We need definitive hormonal and other therapy studies to see what we can do to kind of halt some of these issues. It's one thing to say that our athletes need to eat more. It's another thing to get that to happen in, in practice. And so a lot of times there's a big gap between acceptance and, and sharing that information. So um, it's important that we find other ways that while we're trying to get our athletes to feel better and while we're trying to figure out what the right energy availability is for them, that we're protecting their bones and we're trying to enhance their performance. We need more awareness and prevention programs as well. So we need to be talking about this at more of our sports conferences, definitely more of our coaching conferences, and be talking about this with all of our athletes. So thank you, and I guess at the end we'll have some questions.